Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone, for being here. My name is Ariel. I'm the director of the Amagansett Library. And this wonderful program is um, being co-hosted with us and the Hamptons Observatory. Um, if you haven't been to a Hamptons Observatory program, you're in for a treat, um, although I'm sure many of you are repeat customers. Um, I'm going to add their website into the chat in a little bit for you. Um, that's where you can find uh, some of their other events, and you can also see their newsletter. I do know that on July 11th, they have another event happening. Um, it's a first, a first anniversary event, the science behind the James Webb Space Telescope, and that's also online, and that's at 7. So come back for that. Um, and with that, I am going to... Uh, introduce our speaker today. It is Dr. Kenneth Lenzetta. Um, Dr. Lenzetta obtained a BA in physics from the University of Pennsylvania and a PhD in physics from the University of Pittsburgh. He subsequently held a two-year postdoctoral appointment at the Institute of Astronomy of the University of Cambridge in England, and then spent four years as a postdoctoral researcher and Hubble Fellow at the Center for Astrophysics and Space Sciences of the University of California, San Diego. In 1994, he became an assistant professor in the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Stony Brook University and was promoted to associate professor in 1997 and professor in 2001. He has a lot of research interests and I'm sure he's gonna go over with us today, um, but um, today he is here to talk about the Condor Array Telescope. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Lanzetta. All right, well, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, Thank you for having me uh, here this evening. Uh, yeah, so I guess I'm gonna share my screen now and uh, tell you about what I've been working on for the past uh, several years. Uh, let's see, okay. Okay, so I'm introducing the Condor Array Telescope. Uh, and I'm gonna tell you about that. I'm gonna give you the bottom line first, just in case something happens to the zoom link, right? Uh, so the bottom line, uh, the Condor Array Telescope is an example of a new type of astronomical telescope uh, that I'm calling an array telescope. Uh, I deployed Condor with my team to a superb astronomical site in the southwest corner of New Mexico in the spring of 2021. Over the following months and the following years now, uh, we worked very hard at commissioning and calibrating the telescope and Condor is now in routine operation, autonomously collecting data every clear night. Uh, tonight, unfortunately, happens not to be a clear night, so it won't be collecting data tonight, but otherwise it would be doing it and would be doing it all by itself uh, with no particular instruction from me. Uh, I've got a website, uh, condorarraytelescope.org. Uh, I'm sort of getting it up to date. It sort of fell out of, uh, sort of fell out of date for a while, but I'm sort of uh, slowly working at getting things back on track. And there, there'll be some things there uh, that are kind of interesting to see. And maybe at the very end, I'll, I'll show you a couple of those things. Um, the outline for my talk tonight is I'll talk about who and why and what it is and what it does and what it's been up to. And that is the results that it's obtained uh, you know, over the past year or uh, two years now of operation. Uh, so I'll start with who. And... Uh, <clears throat> Collaborator that I started the project with is Stefan Grimal, who is uh, he was a former student of mine, who's now a uh, uh, engineer at Amazon Web Services. And it turns out that for a project like this, which is very software intensive, it's very good to have uh, somebody like Stefan, who's an expert at sort of uh, the information technology type things that the telescope needs. Uh, Mike Shar is a collaborator at the American Museum of Natural History, David Balsgabo at the Observatory of Paris, John Webb at Cambridge, and Fred Walter at Stony Brook University. Uh, there are a few sort of ex-undergraduate students from Stony Brook who are, uh, have been working on the project, and actually James Garland is a student working at the American Museum. Uh, and then there are a few undergraduate students who are currently working on the project. And then there are a bunch of undergraduate students who over the past few years have worked on the project. And uh, there are a bunch of other people who've contributed uh, in many different ways. And I kind of list some of them here. And I'm very grateful to my wife, Robin, who uh, spent far longer than she uh, sort of signed up for. Whoops, sorry about that. Uh, far longer than she had signed up for. Uh, in New Mexico, installing the telescope back at the height of the pandemic, 
in uh, 2021. Uh, we went to New Mexico for what we thought was going to be a couple of weeks. We ended up staying for four months, and she was invaluable in helping put the telescope together. Uh, Condor is funded by the National Science Foundation. The original grant that funded it was uh, administered through the Advanced Technologies and Instrumentation Program. And then Mike Shar and I got a grant through the Astronomy and Astrophysics Research Grants Program to uh, sort of conduct our uh, research and our work with the telescope. Uh, okay, so why? Why did I want to build something like this, right? Well, this is a, a schematic representation of the ELT, the Extremely Large Telescope. It's a European telescope that's uh, kind of in the construction phases uh, at a great astronomical site in Chile. And that's kind of state of the art. It's sort of like beyond state of the art in the sense that it's not finished yet, right? Uh, but I show this to illustrate that the ELT is a reflecting telescope, right? That is the thing that collects the light for uh, the ELT and for almost all astronomical telescopes that have been built uh, over the past hundred years, at least, it's a mirror, it's a primary mirror. So you can see, if, I, if you can see my cursor, in fact, I can't see my cursor, but uh, at the very center of the image, right, there is kind of like a big uh, mirror, like a really big mirror, right, uh, that collects light and it directs it to the secondary mirror, which is kind of that black thing that hangs above it, and then down through that structure uh, to an instrument or something like that that would ultimately record the light, right? And the thing you're supposed to get, uh, the impression you're supposed to get from this is that that mirror, that primary mirror, clearly something sits in front of it, right? And that's the whole support structure which holds the secondary mirror, right? And so the light that has to ultimately get to the mirror and be focused to the image clearly has to interact with that support structure. And that imposes, that support structure diffracts and reflects light. And that's sort of inherent in the design of a reflecting telescope. There's no way around it, right? Uh, that's just the way it is. You gotta have something hanging above the, the primary mirror and that something is going to interfere with the, uh, with the, the, uh, the image. The largest refracting telescope ever built was built long ago because, again, people don't build refracting telescopes. Refracting telescopes are telescopes with objective lenses. This is the 40 inch Yerkes telescope outside of Chicago, right? And that was built uh, prior to the turn of the 19th century. And uh, that has uh, uh, an objective lens rather than a mirror. And so the thing that collects the light here is a lens, and it's 40 inches in diameter as compared uh, to the VLT, which is many, many times that uh, uh, 30 meters in diameter, right? And that's the, that was the state of the art for, for telescopes uh, more than 100 years ago, right? And uh, the reason is, right, as I said, right, the reason is people build reflecting telescopes on the right these days because it's easier to support a really large mirror, right? You can support it from behind, whereas an objective lens on a refracting telescope like the one on the left the lens has to be supported at its edge, right? Clearly it would be really difficult to make a really, really big piece of glass that was optically perfect that could be a lens. Whereas you don't need the entire piece of uh, the mirror to be perfect. You just need the surface to be perfect, right? So almost all astronomical telescopes that have been built uh, since the Yerkes Observatory 40 inch telescope are an example of a reflecting telescope on the right. But as you see, right, there's got to be something else, right? And here there's a secondary mirror, which uh, directs the light from the primary mirror off to the right to somebody's eye or a camera or an instrument or something like that. And that thing has to hang there and it has to be supported by something. There has to be something to hold it, right? And that's clearly going to interact with the image and it's going to make the image more complicated than it otherwise would be, right? So fundamentally, that's that's uh, sort of the background of uh Kind of what I had in mind. Well, it turns out that in 2013, uh, Roberto Abraham and Peter Van Dockum uh, built what they called a telephoto array by combining off the shelf Canon telephoto lenses, right? So, literally, telephoto lenses that people would use typically for like nature and sports photography with off the shelf, shelf CCD cameras that, are, that were designed for amateur astronomy. And they called their instrument the Dragonfly Telephoto Array. And their perspective was rather than building like one really large refracting telescope, kind of like the Yerkes Observatory 40 inch telescope, why not build a whole bunch of kind of modest size refracting telescopes or telephoto lenses and combine the light electronically? Because we have computers nowadays, because all cameras, right, all astronomical cameras, they're electronic. 
uh, we can combine the light from lots and lots of telescopes electronically rather than directly by building uh, a big, uh, a big uh, uh, lens. And the, the point was that this is off the shelf type technology, so it's relatively inexpensive. And the costs scale literally, literally linearly with collecting area. You want to collect twice as much light, then you just build twice as many uh, telephoto lenses and the, the cost is twice as high, right? So they started off with a little experiment. They used three telephoto lenses to just try to get a feel for it, see how it worked. And then they added a few more and they built a larger array. And then they added a few more and then they added a few more. And currently the array consists of two separate uh, units, each of which are equipped with 24 telephoto lenses. So they've got 48 in total. And as I understand, they're currently scaling and building a different instrument, a new instrument that's kind of a little bit different that has uh, many more telephoto lenses, maybe as much as 100, many as 120 or something like that, right? That was the Dragonfly telephoto array. And it did a lot of impressive things, became very famous and made an impact in the field, right? Well, when I began to think about uh, this issue and I began to think about, uh, it was a very interesting concept and how I might sort of go about things. Uh, I had a couple of different ideas, right? And my different ideas centered on, uh, on the following, right? Rather than using telephoto lenses, right? Which it turns out, don't really deliver very great image quality. It's okay, it's pretty good, right? But it's not sort of as good as it could be in principle, right? And my perspective was kind of, if these guys were kind of like staring at one spot on the sky for a long time, and a long time means like a hundred hours or something like that. And they were trying to build up a very deep image, a very sensitive image of a little part of the sky. It seemed to me that uh, I would like to kind of do that at a rapid cadence. And I would like to sort of record all the things that might vary in the field, right? And those things would be stars and stars are points of light rather than sort of extended object, they're points of light. So I would want an image that was really sort of designed to be able to, uh, to sort of properly measure stars. And so I'd want better optical quality. So I decided that uh, rather than using telephoto lenses, I would use off the shelf apochromatic refracting telescopes, that is refracting telescopes that are built for amateur astronomy that have uh, diffraction limited optics and a finer plate scale so they can better uh, see the details of point sources like stars and they've got a longer focal length as well. So that was one modification. The second modification was at the time that I was thinking about it, uh, a new generation of cameras that are built on CMOS technology rather than CCD technology were just about to become available. So they were literally just about ready. And it turns out that these CMOS cameras have uh, various superior properties to uh, CCD cameras. Namely, they can be built much larger. They've got, uh, let's say, much larger in terms of numbers of pixels. They can be built with uh, really large numbers of pixels compared to CCD cameras. They've got very low noise associated with them, which is ideal, obviously, for detecting very faint things and they can be read very rapidly. That is in less than a second, right? So it turns out that there are literally billions of CMOS cameras, built billions of CMOS sensors uh, that are sold every year, that are manufactured and sold every year because they're used in iPhones and they're used in other sorts of phones. They're used in cars as backup cameras, they're used in manufacturing. So the technology is very rapidly developing, the costs are very rapidly dropping. And these cameras were just becoming available uh, back when I was thinking about this, and they offered these superior pro uh, these superior properties when, in comparison to the CCD detectors. All right, so what is it, right? Well, what it is, is it's this new type of telescope that I call an array telescope. Uh, the current version consists of six off-the-shelf 180 millimeter diameter apochromatic refracting telescopes, each of which are equipped with an off-the-shelf large format C CMOS camera, and they're all mounted together on a common mount. So 180 millimeters is kind of like about that big or so, right? So it's kind of about the size of the lens of each of them. And so I got six of these things that are each equipped with CMOS cameras and they're all mounted on a common mount. Uh, they've got a variety of filters. And so that means I can do different science programs with them. And Condor has a light gathering ability, roughly comparable to that of a half meter diameter reflecting telescope. The kind of a half meter diameter telescope would be something like this. So a conventional telescope of about half meter diameter, uh, that's kind of what Condor has the uh, uh, co uh, equivalent collecting area of. And Condor is what I consider to be a prototype 
for a much larger array. So I wanted to sort of uh, figure out how things work, get everything to work very well. And my idea was that ultimately I could scale this and build a much larger and much more powerful array to address uh, a wide variety of science uh, objectives. So I'll just very quickly, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but I'll just very quickly uh, just kind of show you uh, a little bit of the, 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 the components that make it up. So as I said, there were six of these uh, apochromatic uh, refracting telescopes that were manufactured by Telescope Engineering Company. They build very high quality optics, and that's, uh, that's the telescope that I selected. Uh, as I said, another important innovation was the CMOS cameras that were just becoming available. So I've got six of these ZWO uh, cooled monochromatic CMOS cameras. They've each got these pretty large, large, I mean, like very large format uh, sensors, and they can be read very rapidly, which again was important for my objective of trying to sort of monitor things at a one meter, at a one minute cadence. Uh, there's a mount, which uh, is uh, a mount that is known as a direct drive mount. It's basically like a direct DC motor. It doesn't have any gears or any lubrication or anything like that, which means there's very little to break and it's very reliable. And it doesn't require maintenance. And so it just turns out that's a, uh, a very good way to sort of uh, build a telescope that's remote and that's located someplace where not the access is not easy. Uh, each of them are equipped with certain optics, which uh, sort of uh, which bear on on the image quality ultimately that's de uh, delivered by the telescope. And uh, what I was originally intending to do, and when I had uh, sort of written the proposal to the National Science Foundation, I had proposed to locate the, the telescope at a very good astronomical site in the southern hemisphere in Chile, as a matter of fact. And uh, it turns out that I had proposed and was awarded funding just before COVID hit. And I was sort of ordering the components and trying to put everything together. And it turns out then, then COVID hit and pretty much international travel was shut down. There was essentially no possibility to bring the telescope to Chile like I had planned. And I, I had a, a site selected in Chile and everything was ready to go, but it just turns out I could not do it. There was no way to bring it to Chile. And uh, I really couldn't see kind of like flying anywhere either, because pretty much uh, flying was sort of not uh, not something that you did back at the height of COVID. So I began to scramble and to try to think of where else I could put it. And I thought I probably needed a site in the continental United States that I could kind of just load up my car with stuff and drive to. And so that's exactly what I did. I sort of called all around and I considered sites in California and Arizona and New Mexico. And eventually I selected the Dark Sky New Mexico Observatory, which is located in the very southwest corner of New Mexico, uh, near a very small town known as Animus. It's uh, very remote and it's very, very dark, not at a particularly high elevation, but that's not particularly important for at least the, uh, the prototype element of the telescope. And so that's where I put it. And so that photo on the right, that's a photo that I took uh, during this period back in uh, early uh, 2021, when uh, when I was there for this extended period, kind of building the telescope and putting it all together, there were technical delays and equipment wasn't manufactured properly, and so things took a lot longer than I thought. But anyway, that's a that's a a photograph of the site. You can see here, Animus is kind of like right toward the center of the image here. Uh, this is a map that shows New Mexico on the right, that's Arizona on the left, and Mexico uh, down below. Uh, you see cities of Tucson on the left and El Paso on the right. Animus is almost exactly midway between Tucson and El Paso, uh, which means you have a choice of two airports. It takes about uh, close to three hours to drive from either of those airports to the site. Uh, and it turns out they're far enough away that lights from those cities don't really affect the darkness of the site. Uh, and yet it's not, you know, it's reasonably easy to access, right? That is, you fly to either Tucson or El Paso and then drive for three hours and you can get to the site. And as I say, the site itself is very dark. It's very remote. There's not a lot around there. Uh, there aren't many restaurants or things like that, uh, which is good, obviously, from our point of view, because we don't want any lights and we want things as dark as possible. And this is just a picture of kind of the area. You can see it's a desert, right? And it's uh, it's pretty dry, which is kind of what you'd sort of hope for, right? And that's just a picture of uh, of the area around uh, near the telescope. 
Uh, okay, so I've got two photographs of the telescope that I can show you very quickly. These are taken by uh, a camera that we have, a security camera that kind of looks down and monitors the telescope all the time. So the first uh, photograph is a photograph of the telescope with the roof open. So it turns out the, uh, the observatory building has a roll off roof. So the roof can just kind of roll off on a track and completely expose the, uh, the sky above, or it can roll back on and cover up the telescope. Uh, so as you see here, right, there are six telescopes mounted onto this mount, right? Uh, right now, each one of them has a dust cover. You see that thing that covers the front of them, that's like a flap that can either open up or close, and it closes to protect the uh, objective lens from dust. Uh, you can sort of see on the back end of these telescopes, that's where all the, uh, the cameras and the filter weir, which holds the filters and the focuser and the correcting lenses, they're all contained on the back end of this telescope. And what you don't see is behind the camera here is sort of a, a room, a computer room, where the computers that uh, control uh, the telescope are located. And as I said, they sort of do their job uh, autonomously, right? Those, those computers uh, basically tell the observatory roof to open when it's appropriate. And then they telescope, tell the telescope to go off and do its program, whatever that is, obtain calibrating observations and then obtain science observations. And the whole thing works completely autonomously. Uh, here's another picture of the telescope, kind of at dusk or, or so, right? Or maybe it's dawn, I don't remember. But uh, this is a, a sort of a picture of the telescope in action. You can sort of see that the, the dust covers are open and it's pointed somewhere uh, sort of requiring some data. And so that's just, uh, that's kind of what it looks like in its setting. All right, I have, uh, turns out I have a, uh, uh, a drone video, right? And I think it's just worth it because it's kind of cool, right? So here we are, this is a drone video looking down at Condor uh, with the roof open. So I hope this will play. Yeah, there we are. Okay, so this shows you uh, kind of the perspective of the telescope uh, there at its site. All those cables lead to the control of the computers in, in the control room. And they're what ultimately uh, sort of uh, you know, operate the telescope. Uh, okay, so that's it in its site, right? So as I said, uh, it operates completely autonomously, right? That is the uh, computers are responsible for opening and closing the observatory, for monitoring weather conditions to see whether things are appropriate to be opened or closed, if it's gonna rain or if it's gonna be windy, uh, it knows that and it does the appropriate thing. Uh, it obtains calibration observations during the day and during dawn and dusk twilight. It selects the appropriate filters, focuses the telescope automatically, acquires targets, points, tracks, and then ultimately uh, sort of acquires the data, stores the data, and then sends the data back to uh, some computers at Stony Brook for archiving and processing, right? So when things work properly, that is when everything's working, uh, pretty much, you know, we load it up with a schedule and we don't have to do anything. It just kind of makes its own decisions based on uh, current weather and other environmental conditions. And then if things are appropriate, it'll open up, obtain observations. And if things ever become inappropriate, it'll close itself and protect itself from damage. Of course, things never work, or they'll say that not never, but they oftentimes there are problems and we're still in, in the process of uh, kind of fine tuning all the software to make everything work pretty well. Uh, this is just a, a picture of the, uh, the computers that control the, uh, that control and uh, control the compute, the telescope and acquire data. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but Raspberry Pis are kind of little tiny computers uh, on a single circuit board that uh, run kind of modern kind of software uh, in a very small sort of uh, small sort of package. So we've got eight Raspberry Pi uh, computers that are kind of the computers that are responsible for operating everything. And then there's a bunch of other stuff that connects things to the different uh, components on the telescopes. But ultimately, it's those eight Raspberry Pi computers that are sending off the instructions to uh, the computers, not to the telescopes. They're talking to each other, telling you know each other where to send the data, when to send the data, when to operate various components and things like that. And then ultimately, when they've acquired the data, they send it back to uh, a data center uh, based on Stony Brook uh, campus. Uh, we've actually got seven Dell computers there. This says uh, six here, but there's actually another one that we added. And these slots all uh, are, are uh, slots for hard disk drives, right? and they've all got hard disk drives uh, that can store a lot of data, right? So again, we acquire you know pretty big images, right? Because the format of the detectors is pretty large. There are six images that we acquire every time we take an exposure, 
And in one mode of operation, we're uh, acquiring these observations at a one minute cadence, which means that every minute we got six pretty big images to store. And of course, our objective is to scale this to much larger. So we know that we have to be uh, able to sort of really uh, sort of store, process and analyze uh, very large uh, quantities, or, uh, quantities of data. So I checked just this afternoon, just before, uh, just before I, I sort of got ready for the talk here. And as of this afternoon, Condor had acquired uh, almost 1.6 million images, right? So over the roughly two years that it's been in operation, it's got about 1.6 uh, million uh, images that it's acquired. Our typical processing and analysis tasks involve literally like hundreds of thousands, uh, hundreds or thousands of jobs and thousands or tens of thousands of images, and they take days or weeks to run. So this is, in a very real sense, uh, you know, a, an, an IT problem. Right? This is something where uh, if you don't have kind of the expertise and the ability to kind of like take these uh, very large numbers of images and then appropriately sort of process them in a way that makes sense, uh, it's not going to work. And so, you know, we really think uh, from our perspective that it's the IT aspect of this is one of the most important. And, uh, you know, our, our, our contributions partially have to do with that. And of course, we built this in such a way that it can be scaled. And then as if we can eventually scale up the telescope, we obviously have to scale up uh, the computing as well. Uh, so what does it do, right? Well, let's see. Uh, again, I told you that the whole motivation was, you know, to build refracting telescopes rather than reflecting telescopes. And that is, I want it to be sensitive to very low brightnesses, right? Things which are very, uh, very faint and very difficult to see, especially for the refract, refract, reflecting telescope, where again, this structure that holds the, uh, the secondary mirror uh, naturally kind of must be there and it degrades the image quality and it can scatter, uh, scatter starlight. And it turns out that scattered starlight is the, is the predominant uh, reason that it's difficult to see very faint things, right? So Condor's special ability, or at least one of its special abilities has to do with the fact that it's a refracting telescope and it does not have that problem. So it should be able to see things that have much lower brightnesses than reflecting telescopes. The second thing I told you that, again, I, I built these uh, telescopes with these CMOS cameras that can be read very rapidly in less than a second, which means that it can operate at a rapid cadence. A CCD camera, right, these sort of older technology would typically take a minute, maybe even two, three minutes to read out, right? And so if it takes one or two or three minutes to read the detector, uh, it doesn't make any sense to try to take one minute exposures because you're going to spend most of your time reading the detector. If you can read the detector in less than a second, then it does make sense to take one minute exposures. And so that's another motivation. And again, we equipped Condor with a bunch of different filters, including some filters that are tuned to the spectroscopic signatures of gas emission. And that means we have the ability to study uh, things that oftentimes people don't study and uh, that's another thing that uh, the, the Condor is sort of equipped to do, right? So as I told you, in its normal mode of operation, the way we typically operate it is we'll go to some spot and we know that we want to build up a really deep image of that spot. It's going to take a lot of exposures over, you know, maybe a hundred hours or something like that, right? But we said that while we're doing that, we might as well be trying to monitor all the, the, uh, the point sources that are in the image, all the stars that are in the image. And so we're gonna do this at a rapid cadence, right? And so that's our normal mode of operation. We'll go to a particular spot and try to obtain a deep image. And we'll do that by uh, monitoring that spot at a minute cadence for you know, many tens or perhaps a hundred hours and ultimately build up uh, sort of a whole lot of images which can be added together to form one deep image. Or we can look at all the ind images individually and see how it is that the, uh, the brightnesses of different things in the image uh, vary, right? So that's basically what it does, right? <clears throat> and those are sort of the uh, the things that that it's it's especially capable of. So our objectives have to do with uh, things related to faint galaxies, right? So galaxies and the low brightness parts of galaxies, the things that reflecting telescopes are not good at seeing, uh, because we have the ability to see very low brightnesses. Uh, one of our objectives is to study stuff that has to do with the outskirts of, of galaxies or very faint galaxies or aspects of galaxies that are too faint to be seen uh, by sort of conventional telescopes. Another of the objectives is to study uh, the late stages of stellar evolution. 
by identifying things like supernova remnants and nova shells and planetary nebulae in our Milky Way galaxy. So uh, stars live their lives, right? All stars live their lives and eventually their lives come to an end when they run out of nuclear fuel. Depending on the mass of the star, that star might end its life in one of uh, many different ways, right? One possibility is if it's a very massive star, it could explode as a supernova and that explosion will cast gas back into the interstellar medium and that will leave uh, you know, an imprint of that gas, right? Another possibility is that a star like the sun, for instance, right, which is not a very massive star, it's kind of an ordinary star, it'll end its life by becoming a red giant star and sort of swelling up and becoming much larger and then eventually start to pulsate and cast off its outer layers and those outer layers will uh, will form planetary nebulae, which are another uh, sort of signature of the gas that has been returned to the interstellar medium from stars. So we can study that sort of stuff because, again, this stuff could be very faint, and we have the ability to study very uh, faint things. Another thing we're doing, right, is because we're monitoring these fields at this one-minute cadence, right? Well, it turns out that uh, white dwarfs, right, which are the endpoints of uh, the lifetimes of stars like our sun, after our sun becomes a red giant, it pass off its outer layers, what's left over will collapse uh, to about the size of the earth and form a white dwarf. Well, it turns out that it's possible, right, that white dwarfs are orbited by earth-like planets and such a, at such a distance that uh, they, they, uh, they reside in the habitable zone. And the habitable zone of a star is the zone at which liquid water can exist on the surface of an Earth-like planet. And it's possible that, uh, that Earth-like planets could exist in the habitable zones of white dwarfs, right? No one knows, right? But people have calculated that these habitable zones can persist for several billion years. And an Earth-like planet in the habitable zone of a star is obviously a potential site for outside of life. And it turns out what's special about that configuration is, again, the white dwarf is about the size of Earth. And that means if we happen to find uh, situations where the Earth-like planet transits the white dwarf, that is, periodically passes in front of the white dwarf, the white dwarf will dip in brightness uh, for a short period of time, for about a minute or two, right? And we'll be able to discover the planet, right? If we discover such planets, right? Because the Earth is about the same size as the white dwarf, the Earth's atmosphere will actually leave a, a significant imprint, a spectroscopic imprint on the light of the white dwarf. And it's in principle possible to study the atmospheric composition of those, uh, those planets, right? More easily than it would be able to study the atmospheric composition of Earth-like planets that transit normal main sequence stars like the sun. So that's potentially why that's very interesting. And of course, it's very well suited to Condor because Condor is observing things in a one minute cadence, right? And the expectation is that every 10 hours or every 20 hours, uh, the brightness will dip for about a minute or two and Condor could see that, right? So we're also looking for transiting Earth-like planets in the habitable zones of white dwarfs. That's kind of another of our primary science objectives. So let me sort of tell you uh, a bit about what it's been up to and what it's done. And I realized that I forgot to put one of the slides that I wanted to put, which I'll try to find on my computer at the end, which has to do with exactly that, right? So namely, I think we've got like one, you know, decent candidate for such an instance, right? An instance of, a, of an Earth-like planet transiting the white dwarf. And I forgot to put the slide in, but I'll try to dig it up and show it at the very end. So what has it been up to, right? Well, the first thing that it sort of did, because it turns out this is just kind of, uh, it's become kind of like a test case in the field. Uh, different groups have obtained different results in this particular area of low brightness measurements. And, you know, we figured Condor should make its contribution and see where it stands on the issue. So let me tell you about the curious case of NGC 5907. NGC 5907 is also known as the Knife Edge Galaxy, which is an edge-on spiral galaxy that was considered the prototype of an isolated warped spiral. So edge-on means that a spiral galaxy is a disc-like galaxy. It's got spiral arms that are confined to a disc, and it's edge-on in the sense that it's almost exactly aligned with the line of sight. So it appears very thin, and it appears almost like a knife edge. I'll kind of drop, uh, jump ahead and show you this image of NGC 5907, right? So you see that thing that runs diagonally, uh, kind of left, uh, lower left to upper right, 
that's the galaxy, right? You see it's edge on in the sense that uh, kind of it's aligned almost exactly with the line of sight. So it kind of looks almost like the edge of a knife, right? Uh, all right, in 2008, an amateur astronomer obtained an image of NGC 5907 that showed two loops of a tidal stream surrounding the galaxy. So the idea here was that a dwarf companion galaxy to NGC 5907 was ripped apart by tidal forces uh, that were related to its orbit around nine, uh, NGC 5907, and that it produced these two loops of debris uh, that this amateur uh, uh, saw in the image of uh, NGC 5907. So again, here's the image, and here's the image that this amateur found, right? You see, clearly see there's this helical structure, right, that has two loops that surround the galaxy, right? And this became a very famous and very sort of iconic image, right, that kind of became like the poster image of that process, the process by which a, a dwarf companion galaxy is ripped apart by the tidal effects of, uh, of uh, its orbit and its interaction with the, the main galaxy, and it left that debris, that signature of the interaction, right? Well, it turns out that over the years, right, various other amateur groups have obtained and published various other images, and they all show two loops of a helix, right? And I'll show you that in just a second, right? Well, it turns out that in 2019, Dragonfly, right, kind of the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the telescope that motivated Condor, obtained a deep image of NGC 5907 and found an entirely different morphology. They found a single current stream that extends well beyond the previously reported features. And as I said, this discrepancy has become very controversial and kind of like now there's this, uh, this, this uh, sort of essentially a debate between the, the many different amateur groups who found two loops of a helix, the dragonfly uh, group that did not find uh, two loops of a helix, right? So I thought it was important that Condor as a test kind of, right, should weigh in, should obtain its own observations of NGC 5907 and see where it stood on the image, uh, on the issue, right? Okay, so again, that's the kind of image that became the iconic image of NGC 5907. And as I said, there were a bunch of different amateur groups, right? And here I show, uh, I show five of them, right? So the ones on the outside, right? The upper, uh, the one of the top middle, right? That's different. That's the Dragonfly team, right? Forget that for a second. The other four, the upper left, the upper right, the lower left and right, right? You look at those images, they were all obtained by amateur groups, right? And they all show very clearly the same structure. They show two loops of a helix, right? But then you look at the image on the uh, upper uh, middle, right? That's the dragonfly image, and it doesn't show that, right? It shows something completely different, right? There's only one loop, right? And that loop extends on the bottom, you know, much further than any of the amateur groups, right? Okay, so this was a big puzzle, right? There were four different amateur groups, at least. There were actually some more, right? Which I'm not showing here, but there were many amateur groups. They were all observing the same thing, right? They're all finding the same thing. Then the dragonfly guys come along, right? And they get their deep image, right? And they don't see it at all, right? So how can this be, right? How can it be that there's many different groups, you know, sort of find that, and then the dragonfly group does not find that. It doesn't seem to make any sense, right? Okay, so we decided, again, as a test, right? We had to weigh in. We had to see our, our telescope supposed to be uh, designed to see very low brightness things. So what does Condor see? So in the uh, spring of 2021, we spent about 100 hours observing, uh, observing NGC 5907, uh, and we did it for about another 50 hours in the spring of 2022. And we did this at a bunch of different pointings, right? Just uh, for various reasons, we thought we'd do uh, this at a bunch of different pointings. And the result is the deepest image by far ever obtained of NGC 5907 and the NGC 5907 field. And this is kind of like one of our images, right? Not processed in a way that's supposed to highlight just yet, I'll show you in a second. But this is kind of like an example of our image, right? So this is the Condor field of view, which again is a pretty big field of view because the detector format has a lot of pixels, right? And you see NGC 5907 is right in the center, right? And you know that's one of the images that we obtained. Again, this image is made up of uh, 10,000 individual exposures. Again, there are many, many one minute exposures that make up this image, but that's one of the images that we obtained of the field, right? Okay, well, it turns out, as I said, uh, the primary 
problem or the primary difficulty in seeing very faint things, very low brightness things, is scattered starlight. So you look at this field and you see there are clearly stars all over the field. There are also some other galaxies sort of obviously in the field, right? But there are also a lot of stars, right? And those stars, they sort of appear to be uh, sort of concentrated here, but in fact, their light spreads over, you know, a very large angle, right? Just like, you know, when the sun is in the sky over there, right? I mean, the whole sky is illuminated, right? So that's scattered star, uh, scattered sunlight, right? So the sun is up and if the sun is up, the entire sky is illuminated in blue because light is scattered by Earth's atmosphere. Well, the same thing applies for stars. If there's a star up, right? Its light is scattered all over the, the sky. It's very faint compared to the sun, but it's there nevertheless. And there are a lot of stars, right? So that's the predominant uh, sort of thing that we're battling. It's scattered starlight, right? So if we want to account for that, we have to model the starlight very accurately and then subtract the effects of the starlight to remove this uh, scattered starlight so that we can see what's left over. And the stuff that we think you know, that's left over is the stuff we're looking for. That's the galaxy features, right? Okay, so that's what we did, right? We worked very hard at modeling the starlight, right? And then subtracting the effects of the starlight so that we can see uh, you know, to the extent that we can do this, right, there obviously it's not perfect, but we try to do as best as we can, right, we subtract the effects of starlight, and this is kind of what's left over after we do that, right, so now if you look, you see that the field is still covered with thousands of little things, right, well, they're not stars, they're actually faint galaxies, right, so we have a really, really deep image of this piece of the sky, right, we've subtracted, you know, you can see clearly for the brighter stars, it's, it's difficult, we haven't done it perfectly, but we've more or less subtracted the starlight, we've modeled it very accurately and subtracted it, and what's left is the stuff that's left, and one of the things that's left are very faint galaxies, right, so clearly, right, there are thousands of very faint galaxies. These are very faint background galaxies. They're way behind NGC 5907. They're not really related to what we're interested in, but nevertheless, they're there. But we look at NGC 5907, and very clearly, right, there's one loop. There's not two loops, right? There is definitely, positively, not two loops, right? Okay, there's one loop, right? I wish I could show my cursor so I could kind of trace this out. But you see on the left-hand side, you see the loop. That's the same loop that the dragonfly guys saw. And then if you follow that to the right, past the galaxy, you see that it kind of bends up and it ultimately hits this galaxy kind of right at this apex, which I can't show you because unfortunately, at least I, oh, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. That's not what I wanted to do. Uh, but it, you can trace it up, right, to this kind of bright, almost point-like galaxy. And then you can kind of trace it back to the left, right? So it joins up with the galaxy again, right? All right, well, that's sort of new morphology, right? That's something that the uh, the Dragonfly team didn't find. That's not what the amateurs found, right? And, you know, that's what we find. And then if you look off to the left, right, you kind of see, right, you know, sort of just go to the galaxy and then go to the left. And you kind of see this kind of like smoky-like thing, right? that continues all the way to the left-hand edge of the field, right? All right, well, now let me show you the same image kind of at a higher contrast, right? Or an easier uh, to illustrate these things, right? So again, if you sort of follow the main loop, right? Past the galaxy, you see the loop continues, right? And bends up to the top till it reach, reaches that sort of point-like thing, uh, which is actually a galaxy. It's actually a dwarf companion galaxy to NGC 5907. We think it's, uh, it's implicated and related to this whole feature. And then it kind of heads back and you see another big blob that's actually another dwarf galaxy associated with NGC 5907. And then it ultimately hits, uh, hits the galaxy again. And then you look on the left-hand side of the top of the galaxy and you see kind of like a horn that sort of emanates from the galaxy toward the top, right? That's a new feature that we discovered. And if you look down toward the bottom of the loop on the right-hand side, you see kind of an extension that kind of juts out from the, uh, from, the, from the stream as well. And now you very clearly see to the left, right? This kind of like little thing meandering until it eventually hits that patch about, uh, let's say middle of the image, a quarter of the way to the left-hand side, quarter of the way from the left-hand side, there's a patch of emission, right? That now continues, that stream continues and there's another patch of emission right on the, uh, the, uh, the, the left-hand edge of the image uh, here, right? Okay, well, this is all new morphology uh, of NGC 5907. 
This shows the patch, right? If you look at the right-hand side, that's that little piece of the loop, right? You can sort of catch the loop. And this is that patch, right? This illustrates the linear feature, the first patch, the continuation of the linear feature and the second patch, right? Okay, so because Condor is able to, to uh, study very low brightnesses, we were able to discover uh, what I think is the correct morphology of NGC 15907. Our results are consistent with the dragonfly results. They're inconsistent with the amateur groups. And we've discovered what we think are new features that are fainter than uh, the dragonfly group uh, was able to discover. Uh, okay, it turns out we have another result. I told you we we're also interested in things having to do with endpoints of stars' lives and things like that. Uh, there's a famous dwarf nova, which is known, uh, basically we call it ZCAM, right? It's a, it's a cataclysmic variable star system, and it's an example of a dwarf nova. And a dwarf nova is a close binary star system that consists of a white dwarf that accretes matter from the stellar companion. So it's got sort of an ordinary star in orbit around uh, a white dwarf, and it accretes matter from the white dwarf, and that periodically causes uh, an outburst, a nova outburst, where the star becomes brighter for some period of time. And as a result of that, it can cast off this material and this material can sort of head back into the interstellar medium. Well, my collaborator, Mike Shara, uh, a while ago, about 15 years ago, used the Kitt Peak 4 meter telescope to obtain what was at the time by far the deepest image of ZCAM. And he speculated that a shell of gas surrounding ZCAM uh, may have been ejected in a Nova explosion recorded by Chinese astrologers in 77 BCE. And he was interested in seeing whether a uh, condor could measure the rate of expansion of the shell, right? That is whether he could take a, another image 15 years after his previous image and see if the shell had kind of moved in position a little bit. And if it had uh, perhaps be able to work out the rate at which it sort of was expanding, right? And then from that, you know, deduce when, when the expansion started and hope that maybe that would be consistent with this report of a Nova eruption, which took place in 77 BC. So this was the Kitt Peak image that, uh, that was the state-of-the-art image when we set out to do this, right? So ZCAM is that star right in the center of the field, kind of got a circle around it that just illustrates or, or, or tells you what which star uh, ZCAM is. And then if you look down below, uh, the most prominent thing you see is kind of this, this sweeping arc, right? So that was the arc that he was interested in. He speculated that this arc is the result of material that was ejected in this Nova outburst in uh, whatever it was, 57 or 70, uh, 77 BC, right? And what he wanted to do was obtain a new image of ZCAM and check the arc at a new epoch and see whether he could see a little shift in the position of the arc from which he could work out an expansion rate and then hopefully deduce, uh, deduce an age, right? All right, so we obtained, uh, Condor obtained observations, and these are some of the observations that Condor obtained. And again, we've got narrow band filters, which are tuned to various emission lines of prominent uh, ions of different atoms uh, in, uh, in, in, in these, these objects, right? And we've got these different filters here. We've got six different filters here. So now if you look at the upper right-hand image, uh, sorry, the upper middle image, right? That kind of looks, you know, pretty similar to that, right? You see the same sorts of structures, right? That is, you see this prominent arc. That's the thing he was interested in, right? And, you know, it kind of looks very similar to the Kitt Peak image that was obtained uh, 15 years ago. But then you look at the three images on the bottom, right? That is the H-alpha, nitrogen-2, and sulfur-2 images, right? And when I first processed these images, when I first looked at them, I, I said, geez, I mean, I don't know. I see, like, kind of a circular structure, like a disk, right? So I asked Mike, I said, Mike, you know, I don't know, I, I was completely unfamiliar with this. I said, ZCAM, is this whole thing is just like a, you know, a, a bubble, you know, a bubble or something? He said, well, I don't think so, right? But then he looked at the image and he said, well, geez, I mean, it has to be, right? So we discovered uh, the bubble, right? The entire bubble that surrounds ZCAM, right? So the Kitt Peak four meter telescope, a much, much larger telescope, right? Which had obtained uh, the deepest images in about the same exposure time as Condor, was unable to see this bubble, right? But very clearly we saw this bubble, right? And so we have these different filters and we very clearly then discovered that there was actually a sort of a bubble which was the entire result of this material that was ejected in the ejection that took place uh, when this was formed, right? Well, if you add them all together, this is the color image that results, right? So this, uh, again, I wish I could show my cursor, but 
anyway, this clearly this, this uh, structure at the top, this kind of circular structure, which includes the arc, right? And it includes clearly various components of the arc. The different colors here represent different uh, of these ions, right? They're different, they're probing different uh, sort of temperatures and densities within the, uh, the nebula, right? And clearly there's a lot of detail which is visible in, uh, in this nebula, right? And that was newly discovered by Condor. It was not possible to do that using the Kitt Peak four meter telescope, which you know back in the 1980s was close to a state-of-the-art telescope, right? And uh, you know, that telescope could not do it. It's a reflecting telescope, Condor's refracting telescope. So Condor was able to discover this very low brightness uh, nebula kind of uh, surrounding ZCAM, right? But then I began to look at it in some more detail. And I said, well, hang on a second, right? I mean, there's actually like another ring, right? There's like another ring that surrounds the whole thing right at the edge of our image, right? I kind of clearly see kind of like another ring still. He said, well, geez, I mean, that could actually be the case because again, these novae are recurring. That is, they puff off their gas, right? And then sometime later, they puff off some more gas. And then sometime later, they puff off some more gas. So this might be the result of the explosion, the one before 77 BC. So that could very well be, but he said like, I'm not really sure. Are you really sure that Condor is able to, de to detect that? I said, well, geez, Mike, I think really, I think I am, right? Well, to sort of be sure, right? What I decided to do was to pr process the image in such a way that I took just big chunks and added them all together, right? And this is the result that I get, right? So clearly the circular structure, right? This bubble surrounding ZCAM, that's this prominent thing at the top. But then there's kind of no doubt about it, right? There's this second ring, right? This is the result of a previous ejection or perhaps even previous ejections, which have kind of piled up together and kind of come to a halt because they're being pressed on by the interstellar medium. So Condor was not only able to discover, right, the entire uh, structure of the first bubble, right? But it's also been able to discover, right, this second bubble, right? And if you look on the right hand side of the second ring, right, kind of, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, on the right hand side, at, at the middle of the second ring on the right hand side, you kind of see like a red, uh, kind of a red region, right? Well, that's a region that appears to be a sulfur emitting region kind of embedded in the, the second ring. So as I see it, this, uh, this image reveals uh, much in, in detail, great structure in, in everything that's going on here. And uh, you know, none of this stuff was visible with uh, previous telescopes, but we were able to measure uh, kind of the details of the structure, which again are related to temperatures and densities in the nebula. Uh, okay, so that's another result that Condor was able to get. Uh, Condor has also been searching for intergalactic novae and supernovae. And it's again, because we're obtaining these observations, at a one minute cadence, and we're observing them night after night after night to build up deep images. If we take our images and add them up, let's say on a nightly scale, right? So we add up this night and then the next night and then the next night and then the next night. Now we have the ability to monitor things not on a minute scale, but on a daily scale. And there could be things like novae and supernovae that are going off in the field. And they could be very interesting tracers of things that might be far from the galaxies. So we decided to process our images to look for, uh, for novae that might have been uh, resulting from stars that were flung out from the galaxies due to their interactions, right? So interactions between galaxies, when two galaxies interact with each other, that can cause stars and gas to be stripped from the galaxies and sent out into intergalactic space. And maybe we can see that very low brightness uh, material by looking for nova eruptions that would occur from time to time in that material, right? So that would again be something that would bear on, uh, you know, on using these novae as kind of like beacons of material and they're easier to see than an ordinary star because they're brighter when they explode, right? So the idea was could Condor discover intergalactic novae that had been thrown out from the galaxies, right? All right, well, the answer is yes, right? So we decided to observe a famous pair of interacting galaxies that's M81 and M82, right? They're nearby galaxies that are well studied, that are known to be uh, galaxies that interact with each other and interaction would be necessary to fling these stars. And we decided to study them. And in fact, we found uh, intergalactic novae. In fact, this is just one. We found at least three so far and we're just kind of starting the analysis. We're probably gonna find more, but here's an example, right? We've got uh, different epochs here. You can see 2021, 1201. 
that's December 1st of 2021. And then you see eventually on uh, January 6th, you see something appear that was not there previously. It's still there on January 25th and it's faded away by February 3rd and it's not visible on February 6th, right? So again, we've got observations, right? And you know, clouds come and clouds go, the weather's good, the weather's bad. We don't get observations every night necessarily because of just the vagaries of the weather, right? But we've got these different observations at these different epochs. We were able to discover a star which appeared and then disappeared. It's exactly consistent with the NOVA, right? So we're taking that to be the first detection of the NOVA uh, in, uh, in the region of M81, right? So this is our image of M81. And that particular NOVA is way out. It's 13 and a half kiloparsecs from the center of the galaxy. So it's essentially an intergalactic NOVA, right? That is a NOVA that's not within the galaxy itself, but has been flung out from the galaxy. And we have two more that are at even larger distances. Okay, so that's something else that, uh, that Condor has done, right? Well, it turns out that uh, this here is our image of M81 and M82, right? This is our broadband image of M81 and M82. M81 is the galaxy right in the center. And then M82 is the galaxy right above it, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, just, just the next big thing that you come up against, that's M82, right? All right, well, it turns out this image, however, is constructed as a mosaic of 13 different pointings. So we have 13 different pointings where we've stayed, we, we spent a lot of time and obtained a very deep image of that part of the sky, right? So again, there are 13 different condor pointings. You can see kind of the fields, you know, one, two, three, four, you can see them uh, arranged here, right? So we've made this mosaic of these different pointings. And remember each of these pointings, uh, you know, we, we've uh, stayed at that spot and we've obtained many, many observations at a one minute cadence. So for all this field, we're able to look for these transiting Earth-like planets, right? We're also able to get a very deep image and clearly what you see is this structure all over the place, right? Well, the stuff which is all over the place is the, uh, I think the deepest observations uh, ever of what is known as galactic cirrus. So galactic cirrus are clouds in our galaxy that scatter starlight, right? And they produce this, this uh, light that we see. Clearly, if we're interested in looking for extra galactic things, right? That is things beyond our galaxy, this cirrus is going to be an impediment to studying that, right? So clearly the galactic cirrus, these clouds of tenuous gas that reflect starlight in our galaxy are going to make it difficult for us to see stuff beyond the galaxy. So we're going to have to figure out how to deal with it, right? How to characterize it, how to subtract it so that we can look for extra galactic things. And we have done that. And I just thought I would show you this. I hope this works, right? Because I think this really is an impressive image. Uh, we're about to release this publicly, right? But we can go here and we can kind of zoom in, right? And we can kind of get a feel for the uh, the sort of, uh, you know, the amount of data and the quality of the data that went into this image, right? So we can go back and forth and look at this whole image, which again is many, many pixels. There's about 33,000 pixels across because it's this mosaic of this large format camera. There are many, many images that go into this, over 10,000 images that make this up, right? And we think this is a pretty cool image that's pretty important in the sense that it's gonna really tell us a lot about the galactic cirrus and about how to account for and measure and deal with the galactic cirrus, right? And this just gives a feel for kind of the, uh, the intricacies of this and how much data there are and things like that. So I thought I would show that. And then let's see, how do I get out of this? Okay, I think I'm going to go back to, uh, there we are. Okay. Uh, okay. And then uh, we've got some pretty pictures as well, right? Condor has been observing different sorts of nebulae and things like that. And I just thought that I would show you a few uh, just very quickly. Uh, that's one, right? This is a, a Condor image of the famous uh, Andromeda galaxy M31, right? So that's an image we obtained, uh, I think it was last fall. It turns out we also have a really big mosaic of the whole region around M31. So I showed you 13 pointings around M81 and M82. Well, it turns out we have 45 pointings around uh, M31, right, the, the Andromeda galaxy. And not only do we have these in these broadband filters like I showed you, 
We also have them in narrow band filters, which I haven't yet showed you because we have, we have very interesting results, but they're not quite ready. Well, we've got a really, really, really big region surrounding M31 that's made up of 45 different pointings, right? Uh, that's the Crab Nebula. So that's, uh, that's Condor's image of the Crab Nebula. Uh, it turns out I included this image, right? This is an image of the Virgo cluster, but I included it mostly because it shows you, if you look at those two little green line segments, right? One kind of to the left of these galaxies on the left, one kind of, uh, I'm sorry, to the right of these galaxies on the left, the other to the left of this galaxy toward the middle. So these little segments of, uh, of green, right? Well, they're actually asteroid trails on two different nights, right? So. Uh, two different nights, uh, you know, Condor observed this field, the asteroid moved over the course of the observations, making that little green trail, trail, came back the next night and observed it again, right, that created the second trail, right, so Condor can also look for solar system objects, things like uh, asteroids and perhaps undiscovered asteroids and perhaps near-Earth asteroids. We're also looking for Planet Nine, and we've obtained observations uh, at two different epochs looking for Planet Nine. Not going to talk much about that, but it's something else that we've done. Uh, this just kind of zooms in on those uh, those things, right? And I'll just remind you of the the website there. So that is the uh, the website. Uh, and so I think I'll stop there. I told you I had one result that had to do with uh, the possible detection of a transit, but I think I, I will uh, sort of have to dig that up. And so I think I'll just kind of kind of leave it there for now. And I think that's kind of, yes, that's where I end up. So I'm going to stop sharing now. And I guess I will be uh, ready to take questions if there are any. Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of questions in chat, but if anyone else has questions, um, you can hit your little hand button and then I can unmute you or you could just put it in chat. Um, one of the questions someone asked was if there's an override if um, the telescope or the computers controlling it in the roof stop working or something happens? Yeah, we have, uh, we, we have aspects of that. I would not say that it works perfectly, right? But I'd say that we clearly thought about it. We thought about power outages, things run on UPSs in case there's a power outage. So uh, it's possible that some disaster could happen but it's what we we've tried to get it under control and we mostly have it under control, but I, I would say it's not flawless. Great. And then um, someone also asked, Harold asked if you could recommend any good mobile apps that show us low light pollution areas. You know, no, I can't. I don't, I don't know that. So I'm sorry, but I'm, I'm sure there are. Right. But I, I don't know them offhand. All right. Thank you. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, does anyone you have them, feel free to send them. Um, so Stephen asked, did your M31 survey capture the newly discovered Strautner Dreschler blue streak that was detected with narrow band? I'm not sure how to pronounce this. It's O and then it looks like three L's or three I's. Right. So to be honest, I've not yet processed those images, right? So I think it's gonna be very exciting because I just processed, that is like over the past week, the M81, M82 narrow band images. And I can tell you they're extremely interesting and they've discovered things way beyond what anybody's uh, seen before. They're just not quite ready, which is why I haven't, uh, haven't showed them tonight. I haven't even looked at the M31 images yet. And part of, part of the problem is uh, the mosaics are just too big. I can barely display the uh, the thirteen image mosaics. It's thirty three pixels across, thirty three thousand pixels across. The M eighty, uh, the M thirty one images are going to be over fifty thousand pixels across. And so I've just been kind of reluctant to even uh, try to do it because I know I'm going to have uh, sort of difficulties. But we're going to get to it pretty soon. Thank you, um, Natalie. Asked if um, we share this information with other countries. Uh, so it's all published, right? So we, uh, you know, we, we were working as hard as we can to get the publications out. So the idea is it's science and science is universal and, uh, you know, everything basically only has value if ultimately it's disseminated. And so, uh, you know, we're working as hard as we can to get as many publications as we can as rapidly as we can. Great. And then um, George asks if you would consider increasing the resolution. So uh, 
so the resolution is ultimately limited by the uh, the the astronomical scene at the site. So light has to pass through the Earth's atmosphere and the Earth's atmosphere is turbulent and that causes images of stars to be broadened compared to what they are. Uh, the site that we're at right now is not a particularly good site from the point of view of seeing. Most sites of good seeing are located uh, high, high on mountains, whoops, high on mountains where uh, you know, you're above a lot of the Earth's atmosphere and this is not that sort of a site. Uh, what I'm actually planning to do is to build the expanded condor, which I'm calling Condor South, uh, at a site at a at, at an elevation of 5,200 meters in the Atacama Desert. So, in fact, I'm uh, leaving next month on July, leaving the end of this month uh, around the June 30th uh, to travel to Chile to kind of really go to the Atacama site and really select the spot where I want to put the next telescope, which I expect to be a much larger array. And that's located at, at uh, 17,000 feet, 5,200 uh, 5, meters, which is a really, really high site. So things are very different at 17,000 feet than they are at uh, its current location. Uh, the scene will be much better, and in particular will be above a lot of the Earth's atmosphere, which is, again, the thing that scatters the light. And since scattered light is our problem, right, being at a very high elevation will be very beneficial. So I think for that telescope, it may be the case that the angular re resolution will be significantly higher, in which case we'll have to kind of change the detector format and things like that. But we're not completely sure what we're going to how we're going to proceed with that. And then do you have time for one more question? Or... Sure. OK, so Christopher asked, would the same advantages of refractors over reflectors apply on the International Space Station or future moon base? Or is that a lot of the problem due to our atmosphere? Sorry, or is a lot of the problem due to our atmosphere? Sorry. Right. So I think it's both, right? That is, uh, you know, clearly if you're in space, everything's better, right? Because you don't have an atmosphere to deal with, and that makes everything a lot easier, right? But a, a telescope like this, the Hubble Space Telescope, for instance, is also a reflecting telescope, and it does suffer the same disadvantages uh, of any other reflecting telescope. So uh, for, for the types of stuff that it does, right, for the things that Condor was designed to do, it's actually a far better telescope for that sort of thing than the space telescope is. And it can do the things that the space telescope can't. Obviously, the space telescope can do many things that it can't. But for its realm of operation, it's kind of uh, it's a better telescope than the, the space telescope. Thank you so much. I'm, this I learned so much. I'm sure everyone else did. Um, Donna also wrote in the chat, thank you so much for such a wonderful lecture and for creating such an amazing project, which uh, certainly is making a significant contribution to astronomy. Um, thank, you. thank you so much. All right. Thank you for having me. Yes. And thank you everyone else for coming. And thank you to the Hamptons Observatory for uh, recruiting Dr. Lanzetta to teach us all tonight. Have a, have a good night, everybody. Thanks a bunch. All right. Bye-bye.